This week on Jerusalem Dateline, the U.S. threatens the strongest sanctions ever against Iran. Will the mullahs change course? Plus, Paraguay becomes the third nation to embrace Jerusalem and move its embassy to Israel's capital. And Thou Shall Innovate, a new book on how Israeli ingenuity repairs the world. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Some are calling it the strongest speech ever by a Secretary of State. In his first major address, Mike Pompeo focused on Iran and warning its leaders to change course or face their strongest sanctions in history. CBN's national security correspondent, Eric Rosales, explains. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo gave his first major foreign policy address here at Washington, D.C.'s Heritage Foundation. The secretary presented the new U.S. strategy on dealing with Iran after President Trump's withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal. As President Trump said two weeks ago, he is ready, willing, and able to negotiate a new deal. But the deal is not the objective. Our goal is to protect the American people. Pompeo listed 12 demands that would be the framework for a potential new treaty with Iran. They include Iran fully disclosing and permanently abandoning its nuclear weapons program, ending its ballistic missile program, and allowing inspectors access to all nuclear sites, including military locations which were off limits under the 2015 deal. Iran must release all U.S. citizens, as well as citizens of our partners and allies, each of them detained on spurious charges. Pompeo characterized Iran as an international menace that must end all support of terrorists such as Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Islamic Jihad. The length of the list is simply a scope of the malign behavior of Iran. We didn't create the list. They did. The secretary said the U.S. will also ask Europe to reimpose economic sanctions in a bid to bring Iran back to the negotiating table. If they don't join the U.S., some see that as a costly choice. If they continue taking their rhetoric to the most logical conclusion, that means they would be willing to side with the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism as opposed to the world's best economy. America's enemies must understand uh, that the United States will stand up to those who threaten the free world. Reaction came swift from Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He said anyone who wants to stop Iranian aggression and support peace should support the United States just like Israel does. While well, a spokesman for the Iranian Foreign Ministry called the new policy ridiculous and embarrassing and more like a satire. Secretary Pompeo says the U.S. demands are not unreasonable, yet welcomes Iran's leaders to take a different path. He adds it's ultimately up to the Iranian people to decide their future. Eric Rosales, CBN News, Washington. Paraguay followed the U.S. and Guatemalan leads and became the third country to move its embassy to Jerusalem. The U.S. paved the way with its embassy move on May 14th, following President Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital last December. Guatemala followed suit two days later. Paraguayan President Horatio Cartes came for the dedication and he said he appreciates how Israel courageously defends its right to live in peace. Prime Minister Netanyahu praised the decades of friendship between Israel and Paraguay and said Israel would never forget Paraguay's help saving Jews from Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. Paraguay uh, supported the uh, creation of the State of Israel, the recognition of the State of Israel in the United Nations. We will never forget that. Paraguay. Uh, before, but especially under your leadership, took a very bold stance in international affairs and refused to cooperate with the lies directed against Israel. We always remember that. Thank you, Horacio. Thank you. And thank you, Paraguay. Following the opening of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem, members of President Trump's Evangelical Advisory Board discussed the importance of a new executive order. It's another sign of the growth of faith-based initiatives coming from the White House. I will soon be signing an executive order to create a faith initiative at the White House. The faith initiative will help design new policies that recognize the vital role of faith in our families, our communities, and our great country. The new executive order established the White House Faith and Opportunity Initiative, and members of President Trump's Evangelical Advisory Board told CBN News it could revolutionize the relationship between faith-based organizations throughout the federal bureaucracy. 
all departments that have faith offices and all federal offices will have a liaison appointed so that the departments along with the White House, the President's agenda, uh, can work together with several initiatives. There are initiatives, of course, religious freedom, um, reducing crime, prison reform, poverty, marriage and family, human sex trafficking, several others that are vitally important and on the heart of our president. His executive order is bringing it back to the White House where Barack Obama moved it over to the Department of Health and Human Services. And if you're not in the White House, frankly, you're just not where the action is. Reid explains how the move could potentially make a difference for people who need help. What we're really going to be doing is rallying the armies of faith and compassion that are caring for the poor, the marginalized, those in prison, those who have been left behind. The faith community has a lot to offer in that area and I, I commend the president for tapping into that resource. Ninety percent of all the homeless shelters in America are either operated by a church or a ministry or a faith-based organization. Uh, whenever there's a natural disaster, whether it's Operation Blessing or Salvation Army or the North American Home Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention or Catholic Charities, they're all right there on the front lines. After a hurricane, after an earthquake, after wildfires, whatever it is, you know, just offering love and compassion to people who need it. Members of the Evangelical Advisory Board met with U.S. Ambassador David Friedman. Evangelicals and the Trump administration have forged a common bond. As you know, the evangelical community was very, very key on the election of President Trump and also very key in terms of uh, our prayer and our uh, being able to speak to the president, even regarding the movement of the embassy. We went to the Oval Office after his decision to thank the president for his bold action. And as I mentioned in the meeting, many came against the president, but he still did the right thing. And we are so honored to have a president who promises something and does what he promised. He is the most, as many people have said, uh, faith-friendly president that they have known in their lifetime. We had over 1,800 faith leaders come through the White House last year alone. I believe this year we will double or triple that. So he continues to reach out, first and foremost, to prayer. President Trump has also made the situation of Pastor Andrew Brunson a priority. More than a year and a half ago, Turkish officials jailed Brunson on what many believe are false charges. CBN's Eric Rosales talked about Brunson's situation with the new U.S. Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom, Sam Brownback. Pastor Brunson is still in one of the worst prisons you can ever be in. Yeah, Correct. He is. he is, and I hear from his family, uh, his wife, his brother-in-law regularly. Uh, the administration continues to really push aggressively. There's a lot of discussion what the U.S. can and should do. Uh, to, to press for his release in a more aggressive fashion. The president's raised it, the vice president's raised it, the secretary of state's raised it. Uh, but you know, it, it, Turkey's just taken a different attitude towards the United States uh, now, much more confrontational uh, with us. And, you know, I, I think we have to respond aggressively. Just like we did with the North Koreans of bringing them home, do you think Andrew Brunson will be brought home? I do. I, and it, it, Honestly, it doesn't make any sense what the Turkish government is doing. These are completely specious charges. There's no factual basis for it. He'd be out of, out of jail, out of being charged for this in five minutes in the United States. There's just nothing that's there. And the Turks are using this at a high level, and it's really hurting the relationship between the United States and Turkey. But um, I, I think ultimately he will uh, come on home. I hope people keep praying for him and for the, the people of Turkey as well. Coming up, Thou Shalt Innovate, a look at how Israeli ingenuity is repairing the world. From technology to medicine to agriculture, Israel leads the world in advances that make the world a better place. Here's a look at just a few breakthrough innovations that change the world. From a device called the Nano Artificial Nose, which sniffs out cancer, to technology that gives sight to the blind and makes the lame walk again, Israel leads the world in medical innovation. Every day, millions around the world use some kind of medical treatment that came from Israel. 
Israeli entrepreneurs and scientists are also pioneers in agriculture and invented techniques that allowed the tiny nation to turn rocky desert landscapes into lush orchards. In his new book, Thou Shalt Innovate, How Israeli Ingenuity Repairs the World, author Avi Jorish profiles wondrous innovations that are changing the lives of billions of people around the globe and explores why Israeli innovators of all faiths feel compelled to make the world better. Here's CBN's Mark Martin with author Avi Yurish. Well, what is it about the Israeli people that makes them such innovators and inventors? Well, Israel has wonderful universities. It has a very diverse set of population. They have Muslims, Christians, Jews, Arabs, all host. They have wonderful government programs and a very, very smart, innovative military. But ultimately, it is the culture of the prophetic tradition that really drives, that sparks Israeli innovation. You can't repeat day after day for 3,000 years, make the world a better place, cure the sick, help those in need, help those that are hungry, without that having a deep impact on the cultural DNA of your people. And ultimately, that is what's driving Israeli ingenuity to repair the world. Israeli tech today is influencing the lives of billions of people, both here in the United States and around the world when it comes to medicine, technology, science, agriculture, and water. That's wonderful. Where does the concept of repairing the world come from? And why do Israelis want to export their ideas to the rest of the world, Avi? So first you have the prophet Isaiah, of course, which calls upon us to be a light onto the nations. And for the last 1,500 years, at least three times a day, religious Jews have been praying the, the prayer Elenu, which calls upon us all to repair the world. No less than 10 times in the Mishnah, the classic body of rabbinic teachings, do we hear the concept of repairing the world. When I bless my children, on Saturday night, we have a very special blessing called Labdil ben Kodesh Lechol, separating the mundane from the holy. And when you try to separate the mundane from the holy, this is the very heart and soul of the state of Israel. Two th 70 years ago this week, Ben Gurion stood at the lectern and declared the existence of the state of Israel, and he said two things. One, Jews are officially welcome to come home after 2,000 years in the diaspora. But secondly, he said, I quote, Israel has the great privilege and the obligation tackle some of the gravest challenges of the 20th century, and we are seeing Israel do that today. It is repairing the world, it is leveraging its technology for the benefit of humanity and making the world better. Well, let's talk about some of the specific ingenious products that Israelis have come up with. First of all, United Hetzela, which means United Rescue, and it saves the lives of millions of people annually. Tell us about that. So what would you do right now if I had a heart attack here in your studio? We'd call 911. We'd call 911, and on average, 20 minutes later, an ambulance will arrive to save my life. But ultimately, that is too long. So a man in Israel named Eli Beer started United Hetzela, and he did three things. One, he trained an army of emergency responders, 5,000 in all. Secondly, he gave each and every one of them an application on their smartphone, like Uber, calling the five nearest individuals to save a life. And lastly, gave many of them a scooter called an AmbuCycle, which is a hybrid between an ambulance and a motorcycle, a little scooter with a box in the back with medical supplies. The national average to get an emergency responder anywhere in Israel is three minutes. In major metropolitan areas, 90 seconds. And so while it still takes 20 minutes for an ambulance to arrive, 90 seconds later, a medical practitioner will be at my door to save a life. And that is saving the lives of millions of Israelis. And that technology is used around the world today, including right here in Jersey City. But there's no reason why this cheap and scalable technology shouldn't be used in every city in the United States. New York, Chicago, LA, San Francisco, Washington, DC, and right here in Virginia Beach. There is no reason. Yeah, that's awesome. That's incredible, those stats. Well, let's now talk about military defense. Israel has the Iron Dome, of course, that's been tremendously successful. Tell us about the Iron Dome and any other uh, military in innovations. So the Iron Dome was the first time in human history back in 2012 that a projectile was shot out of the sky. It has a 90% success rate. And as a result of this innovation, I would say millions of lives on both sides of the border, both Israelis, Palestinians, Lebanese, and Syrians, are saved because when you have a defensive weapon that shoots these projectiles out of the sky, you're by, by definition saving lives. And the military has produced a whole host of other medical devices that are really saving lives around the world. There's a wonderful company out of Israel called Alpha Omega. It's a Christian Arab company based in Nazareth that is producing the technology to pulse the brain for those who have 
Parkinson's, a central tremor, or Tourette's. And that technology is used in hospitals in the United States and around the world. The technology coming from Israel today is simply incredible. It is the prophetic tradition driving the desire to make the world a better place. Well, God has definitely blessed his chosen people, the Israeli people, and he's working through you guys to bless the world. And you've written a book about all of this, Thou Shalt Innovate, How Israeli Ingenuity Repairs the World. I would say that the Israeli people, God is definitely using them to repair the world. Thank you so much for your time, Avi Yorish, author. Thank you, thank you again. Thanks for having me. Up next, we say goodbye to the world's leading scholar on Islam. But his warnings are still relevant today. The world's leading expert on Islam and the Middle East, Bernard Lewis, has died at the age of 101. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel would be forever grateful for his robust defense of Israel and that Professor Lewis's wisdom would continue to guide us for years to come. CBN News interviewed Lewis in Jerusalem in 2008. In his 100 plus years on earth, Bernard Lewis learned to take the long view of history. And in doing so, he had a warning for America and the West. Years after our interview, his views are still relevant today. In his 90 plus years on earth, Bernard Lewis has learned to take the long view of history. And in doing so, he has a warning for America and the West. The main message that I'm trying to communicate is that we are engaged in a struggle comparable with the two great struggles of the 20th century against Nazism and against Bolshevism. And that um, it would improve our chances of winning if we understand who we are and who they are, what it's all about. Lewis says the struggle is between Islam and Christendom, two worldviews that contend that theirs is the one true faith. And while millions of secularists in America and Europe fail to see that they're actually involved in such a conflict, the nature of the fight is crystal clear for radical Islamists like Osama bin Laden. And where you have two religions with the same self-perception, the same sense of vision, the same historical background in the same geographical area, <laughs> a conflict was inevitable. And the conflict has been going on for more than 14 centuries. Crusade and counter-crusade and jihad and counter-jihad and conquest and reconquest. Sometimes one side winning, sometimes the other side winning. When bin Laden and his fellow radicals drove the Soviet Union out of Afghanistan in the early 1980s, people in the West saw a U.S. victory in the Cold War. But the Islamists saw it as the defeat of one of two major Christian powers. And now the, the only obstacle that remains to the worldwide triumph of Islam is the United States. So that is the next target. And uh, that is very clear. Many Americans compare the war against radical Islam in Iraq and elsewhere with the Vietnam War. But Lewis says that's the wrong way to look at it. The difference is that the Vietnamese did not follow us here, except perhaps as refugees seeking asylum. Mm -hmm. uh, these people will. I mean, they were already here before this happened. Um, and if you look at their writings, particularly those of Osama bin Laden, but not only his, this is perfectly clear. They see this as the final stage in the cosmic struggle between uh, the true believers and the unbelievers and the misbelievers. W what are the stakes, Professor? The survival of our civilization. Coming up. See how Christians help new immigrants to Israel, fleeing violence in the Ukraine. Anastasia is a Jewish girl from the Ukraine. Her family had to flee the war with Russia to Israel with only hand luggage, leaving everything else behind. But here's how CBN Israel helped her family. Anastasia hid in the basement and covered her head as bombs rained down on her city in southeast Ukraine. It was the loudest sound I ever heard in my life. My mom came and held me. We thought it would end soon, but it just kept going and going. There were so many explosions, and the bombs fell so fast that I couldn't tell one from the next. The house shook like we were in an earthquake. 
The family survived the bombing, but fighting between Ukrainian and pro-Russian forces only got worse. It was completely lawless, just chaos. Every day there were more gunshots and explosions. It didn't seem real. The whole time I only thought about protecting my children. The worst time was when masked men with the guns came into our home and took my dad. I was afraid I'd never see him again. Anastasia's father was held hostage for many days until he was finally let go. The family knew they couldn't stay in Ukraine any longer. Because they're Jewish, they were able to flee to Israel. I was really sad to leave our home. Everything got left behind, except for what we could carry. The family told me they struggled to find work in Israel and didn't know where to get help with food. We really had nothing to start with, and we didn't know the language. We were quite desperate. Then a local ministry supported by CBN Israel found out about them. Through the ministry, we started giving the family food along with diapers and other necessities. It means so much to us to have the support. The food is amazing and you even helped us find some furniture. I'm so happy to see my children taken care of. Anastasia's father recently found a good job and she's enrolled in school, learning Hebrew and making lots of new friends. With the help of CBN Israel, the family was able to make a fresh start. It's so important for us to know that somebody cares. You guided our first steps in Israel and I can't say thank you enough. It makes me feel great to know that there are all good people in the world. Thank you very much. Well, that's an inspiring story. By the way, CBN News has a new and improved way for you to get news from a biblical perspective. Check out the new CBN News app, available from your app store on all Android and Apple platforms. It's been completely redesigned, it's clean, crisp, and easy to use. So watch videos, get the latest headlines, and in-depth coverage you can't find anywhere else, right on your tablet or mobile device. Finally, as you may know, Facebook has been making major changes over the last few months. And if you're one of our Facebook friends or followers, we want to make sure you'll continue to receive Jerusalem Dateline on your newsfeed. So make sure that Jerusalem Dateline isn't filtered out. Here's the instructions. To do so, use the See First feature. Then make sure Following is highlighted. And then select Get Notifications. And finally, select See First. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And as I mentioned, you can download our new CBN News app. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.